looking to play a frontline heavy armor dual wielding ranger that looks like a viking mixed with a medieval knight. A ranger that picks its target and demolishes them into the hells, while also being pretty damn hard to kill. We're in the right place. Throughout this video, I'll also provide some guidance for doing this build with a heavy two-handed melee weapon if you prefer that over dual wielding. And this is a strength-based ranger build. You can do it with dexterity, but you're going to be a little less tanky, and you're also going to be stuck using flimsy rapiers as opposed to looking like a true viking. Let's jump right into it. In character creation, your choice of race is completely up to you. There's really no wrong choice here, as all races can work great with every class and build in this game. If I had to choose a few races, though, that stand out for this build combat-wise, I would say Half-Orc, as it's great for all frontline melee builds due to Relentless Endurance, which makes you tankier, and Savage Attacks, which gives you the opportunity to deal more damage on critical hits. Also, Wood Elf and Half-Wood Elf can be a solid choice due to increased movement speed, which is a big part of this particular build. For your favorite enemy choice, you're going to go with Ranger Knight, as that gives your Ranger heavy armor proficiency. It's important to note, though, that it may take you a few hours in-game to find decent heavy armor, either from a vendor or as a drop, and it's perfectly fine to use medium armor up to that point. And for Natural Explorer, I recommend taking Wasteland Wanderer Fire to gain fire resistance, meaning that you'll take half damage from fire, and fire is one of the most common types of elemental environmental damage in this game. With fire resistance and this beefy build, you can basically just run right through fire surfaces and not really bat an eye. The damage will be minimal, and your ranger will be an extremely intimidating force on a battlefield. Now at level 6, you get to choose another natural explorer, and I am going to recommend taking Beast Tamer at that time so you get the fine familiar spell. But if you really want a small animal summon at your side right now at level 1 at the start of the game to really get that true ranger feel, feel free to take Beast Tamer now at level 1, and then take Wasteland Wanderer Fire at level 6. I will explain more about Find Familiar when we reach level 6 in this video. On the Ability Scores tab, assign that plus 2 bonus to Strength, and boost your Strength all the way up to 17. At level 8, you're going to take a feat that will boost your Strength score to 18, giving you that plus 4 modifier, but for now, an odd score is fine. And for your bonus plus 1, go ahead and put that into Constitution, and boost your Con score to 16 with a plus 3 modifier. Strength is very important for your chance to hit and damage dealt with your dual melee weapons or two-handed weapon, and constitution will make you tankier, giving you more HP and it will help you hold concentration on the very useful Hunter's Mark spell. After you've taken care of con and strength, the rest of your scores are really up to you, but I will say that I'd recommend at least a 10, maybe even a 12 in dexterity to help with your initiative and dexterity saving throws and also a 10 or a 12 in Wisdom to help you resist enemy Wisdom spells. Now the Ranger's spellcasting ability is Wisdom, but with this Ranger build you're not going to really be using many spells that use your Wisdom modifier, so you don't need a high Wisdom score. What I did was give my Ranger a 12 in Dexterity and a 12 in Wisdom, a happy medium, and that left me with an extra point that won't do anything, but that's okay. I also dumped Intelligence and Charisma, but keep in mind that there's no real true min-maxing in Baldur's Gate 3, as the minimum that you can have in any ability score is 8. You may consider having a higher Charisma score to help you in some dialogue skill checks, but my Ranger build doesn't really care about your social life. At level 2 you get Ranger Spellcasting, and you get to choose two spells. Hunter's Mark and Longstrider are easy picks here, and both play a core role in this particular build. Hunter's Mark is a level 1 concentration spell that lets you mark an enemy at the cost of a spell slot and your bonus action. And that marked enemy will take an extra 1 to 6 damage anytime you hit that creature with a weapon attack. The mark will stay active on your target for as long as you can hold your concentration, and this is one of the reasons why constitution and heavy armor are important for this build. If the creature that you have marked dies, you can reapply Hunter's Mark to another target at just the cost of a bonus action, no spell slot required. Now your routine with this spell will be whenever a combat encounter begins, you'll start off by casting Hunter's Mark on your first chosen target, and then that opponent will be your sole focus. You want them dead. Since this is primarily a dual wielding build, keep in mind that attacking with your offhand weapon costs your bonus action. 
And like I mentioned, applying or reapplying Hunter's Mark also costs a bonus action. So the two may clash with each other a bit when you are first choosing a target or switching to another target. To combat this a little bit, consider focusing on mid to higher HP targets, as you'll be spending more rounds on a single target that way, allowing you to get plenty of offhand attacks with Hunter's Mark already applied. This is one of the reasons why this build is a target seeker as opposed to a holding the line type of build. Now, if you do this build using a two-handed weapon, such as a great sword, this doesn't matter as much as you can apply Hunter's Mark and attack with your weapon's full damage all in the same turn. Longstrider is a phenomenal spell, and it's also a ritual spell, so it'll not cost you a spell slot. Longstrider increases movement speed by 10 feet, which is a pretty significant boost, and it doesn't require concentration, and it lasts until you take a long rest. Immediately after you finish a long rest, you should get into the habit of casting Longstrider on your character, but also on every other character in your party, including summons. This is a great spell that's going to make closing the distance on your targets much easier. You can choose a target and get in their face very quickly. No one is safe from you. For your fighting style, if you're going to go with the dual weapons build, definitely take two weapon fighting here. This fighting style is going to allow your strength modifier, which is currently plus three at this level, to be added to the damage of your offhand weapons attack. This is a nice damage boost. Now without this feat, your strength modifier will only be added to your main hand weapon's attack. If you're doing this build with a two-handed weapon, defense is the fighting style that you want to take and it will boost your AC by one. So at this point in the game, like I mentioned earlier, you'll likely be using medium armor, which is fine for now, but do keep an eye out for heavy armor from loot and vendors. As you progress through the game, you'll certainly be finding high AC heavy armor. Also note that from levels 1 to 3, you're only going to be able to dual wield weapons that have the light property. Scimitars, hand axes, and short swords are going to be your best bet here with the most damage potential, which is 1 to 6 damage per weapon. But when we get to level 4, we will be upgrading in this department. Below your weapon icon, you'll also notice the toggle dual wielding button. If you toggle this on to where it's showing two weapons, when you attack on your turn, if your character has both their action and bonus action available, they will do a main and offhand attack automatically one after the other. If you toggle this off, your character will only do a main hand attack using up your action. And if you want to do an offhand attack, you'll then need to click on the offhand melee attack icon on your hotbar, which costs the bonus action. Now, the reason why you may toggle this off at times is because, for one, you may want to use your bonus action for a heal or an elixir instead of an offhand attack. And two, if you're attacking a creature with very low hit points and you think you can kill it with a single weapon attack, you don't want that offhand attack to go off automatically because the enemy will already be dead from the main hand attack, and you'll just be wasting your bonus action when you could be using it on another creature nearby or using it to reapply Hunter's Mark. Do note, though, that you can also attack with just your offhand weapon attack, saving your action for something else. You can do this by clicking on the offhand weapon attack icon as your first attack. At level 3, you get to choose another spell and also pick a ranger subclass. For your spell choice, there's nothing really that stands out here. Keep in mind that Hunter's Mark requires concentration, and since we're almost always using Hunter's Mark, you're not going to be able to get much use out of the other concentration spells such as Ensnaring Strike and Fog Cloud. I'd recommend Cure Wounds here, even though your wisdom score may not be the best, as you're going to have plenty of unused spell slots with this build. And it's nice to not only have a backup heal in combat, but also you'll probably find even more use out of using Cure Wounds outside of combat to heal up yourself and party members. Because this build doesn't use a ton of spells, when you get to higher levels you're going to have plenty of unused spell slots, so don't be afraid to use up a few of them outside of combat to heal up party members instead of using potions or short rests, or perhaps you're out of both of those. You could also take Speak with Animals if you want to add that to your RP. There's a ton of cool animal interactions in this game. Now let's choose your subclass, and you're going to be choosing the Hunter. You could do a similar build with the Beastmaster subclass and have a full animal companion at your side, but for this particular build, Hunter is what we're looking for. With the Hunter subclass, you get to choose a passive Hunter's Prey, and Colossus Slayer is where it's at. Colossus Slayer will give your ranger an extra 1d8 damage once per turn when you successfully attack an enemy that doesn't have full HP. 
With a dual wielding ranger, this is nice for a few reasons. One, your main hand attack, if it lands, will lower your opponent's HP, and then your offhand attack can proc that Colossus Slayer damage. And two, you have two chances to get Colossus Slayer to proc when you're dual wielding. So therefore, if you miss on one attack, your other hand's attack gives you another opportunity. You only get to proc this once per turn though. At level four, you get to choose a feat. The choice that you have to make here is, do you wanna focus on ability scores first, or take the dual wielder feat right now. I'm going to say take the dual wielder feat right now at level four, because if you wait until level eight or even level 12 to pick it up, more than half of the game has already passed you by without you being able to dual wield the weapons that you want to dual wield. Now with that said, if you feel like you're missing your attacks too much, take the heavy armor master feat at level four, which will boost your strength to 18, and then take the dual wielder feat at level eight. You can respec at any time. The dual wielder feat is going to give you a plus one to your armor class, making you more tanky. And it's also going to allow you to dual wield even if your weapons are not light. So this allows you to now dual wield weapons such as battle axes, long swords, flails, maces, morning stars, and more. And your damage potential is going to go up because many of these weapons have a 1d8 or a 1 to 8 base damage potential while the light weapons that you were dual wielding before would have had a max of 1d6 base weapon damage potential per weapon. These non-light weapons also just look badass, and looking badass is also a part of this build. Look good, feel good, and play good. Do keep in mind though that you cannot dual wield weapons that have the heavy property, or weapons that state that they're specifically two-handed weapons. You can dual wield non-heavy versatile weapons though. If you're going the two-handed weapon route with this build, at level four, I want you to take the Heavy Armor Master feat instead of the Dual Wielder feat. I'll explain Heavy Armor Master more when we get to level eight in this video, where the Dual Wielders are also going to pick this feat up. So now in combat, you're using two 1d8 weapons from the Dual Wielder feat, and both of these weapons will have your strength modifier added to their damage because we took the two weapon fighting style back at level two. You'll also be casting Hunter's Mark on opponents, giving you an extra 1 to 6 damage on both your main and offhand attacks, both of them. And if your opponent is not at full hit points, you'll also get an extra 1 to 8 damage per turn from Colossus Slayer from the Hunter subclass. If you want to look even more badass and deal more damage right before a combat encounter begins, dip both your main and offhand weapon into fire, giving you an extra 1 to 4 fire damage on each weapon for 3 turns. This can be a little tedious, but it's pretty cool. Moving on to level 5, which is going to give you the extra attack feature. When you use the weapon attack action, you'll be able to make another attack at the cost of nothing. But keep in mind, with this dual wielding build, this extra attack is only for your main hand weapon. Hunter's Mark will proc with this extra attack though if your attack lands. Make sure that you get into the habit of using extra attack, as it can be easy to forget that you have it when you're not used to using it. At level five, you also get to choose another spell, and this is when level two spells become available, expanding our list of choices. I'm going to recommend taking protection from poison, which will give your ranger advantage on all poison saving throws and resistance to poison damage. This spell doesn't require concentration and it lasts until a long rest. So get into the habit of casting it alongside long strider immediately after you finish a long rest. You'll have plenty of spell slots available for it, and there's not many other spells that you can get use out of with this build. Before we get to level 6, I do think it's worthy to mention that with any high strength build, throwing weapons that have the thrown property, such as spears and hand axes, can be great if you can't reach an opponent. And this also works with extra attack, meaning you can throw two weapons. At level 6, you get to choose another favored enemy, and your choice here really doesn't matter combat-wise. Take whatever one that you like that offers a non-combat skill proficiency that you're interested in, because all the combat aspects to these don't really fit this build. For Natural Explorer, this is where I'm going to recommend that you embrace your rangerness and take Beast Tamer, which is going to give you the fine familiar spell that you can cast once per short rest without expending a spell slot. So once per short rest would basically mean every combat encounter that you go into in this game, you should have a familiar at your side at the start of that combat encounter. The reason why I recommend Beast Tamer though is not just because it thematically fits the Ranger class, but some of these little guys can be quite useful in not only utility situations such as scouting and distracting, but also in combat. Let me give you an example with my personal favorite and that is calling in the Raven. 
The Raven only has one HP, so it will die if it takes any damage. But if you can get the Raven into the face of the enemy that your Ranger is attacking, the Raven has an attack called Rend Vision. And if this attack hits its target, that opponent will go blind for one round. This will not only give your target disadvantage on their attack rolls and reduce their range of attacks and spells by 10 feet, but it will also make attack rolls against them have advantage. If you can blind a creature and then attack with your ranger, your main hand attack, your offhand attack, and your extra attack will all have advantage on their attacks, which is huge. If your raven is targeted by an opponent right away and dies, this is also fine as an opponent just used up their action on a 1 HP familiar instead of using it on your ranger or another party member. The familiars may feel weak when you look at them at first, and their HP is so small, but there's so many great uses that you can get out of them, and I recommend having one with this build. It's also really fun and cool to be this heavy armor dual wielding ranger on the front lines with a little companion at their side. At level 7, you get to choose another spell, and I'd say take Lesser Restoration here, so you have it in case you need it. But we also get to choose a defensive tactic, which is specific to the Hunter subclass. I'm going to recommend taking multi-attack defense here, once again building on your ranger's tankiness. So multi-attack defense makes it so that when an enemy attacks you, they will then receive a minus four penalty to any additional attacks that they make against you until their next turn. This can be very beneficial as many opponents that you square off with will have extra attack or multi-attack or something along those lines. Multi-attack defense will make their extra attack less likely to land on you, helping your combat survivability. At level 8, you get a passive feature called Land Stride Difficult Terrain, which makes it so that difficult terrain no longer will slow your ranger down. This is a nice passive feature for the ranger class that adds even more to your mobility. And keep it in mind because it is going to synergize well with a spell that we'll be taking next level. At level 8, you also get to take another feat. And this is where you're going to take the Heavy Armor Master Feat. You currently have 17 in strength, so you only need a plus 1 to get that to 18, giving you a plus 4 strength modifier, making you more likely to land attacks and also deal more damage with main and offhand attacks. Heavy Armor Master is going to give you that plus 1 to strength, while also reducing incoming damage from non-magical attacks by 3 while you're wearing Heavy Armor, which you should already be at this point. 3 doesn't sound like a lot, but over the course of a combat encounter, you can mitigate a ton of damage. And this is the perfect feat for this build as it adds to our damage with the strength boost while also making us more tanky. If you're using a two-handed weapon, you would have already taken this feat at level four. So for all of you, I'd say at this level, just go ahead and take the ability score improvement and put two points into your strength, boosting it to 20. You could also take the great weapon master feat. It's a great powerful feat, but only take this feat if you have a party composition that has consistent ways to aid your ranger in their attack rolls. At level 9, you finally get access to level 3 ranger spells, and plant growth is where it's at. The plant growth makes weeds burst from the ground in a 20-foot radius, and any creatures who attempt to move through this terrain will have their movement speed halved. Now, spike growth is also a ranger spell that's really good, and it slows opponents down while also dealing damage to them. But the problem with spike growth is that it requires concentration. Plant growth does not. Now, if you remember last level, we picked up the passive feature called Landstride Difficult Terrain. With this passive feature, you can cast plant growth over an area with opponents in it, and then just move right into that area and attack them without your movement speed being affected at all. This can be great for holding down a choke point, for example. I also really like this spell because it thematically fits the ranger, and even though we're doing many things in this build that make your ranger feel, you know, a bit like a fighter, Things like plant growth and being able to run through it and also summoning a familiar really helps separate your ranger from other martial classes. Do keep in mind with plant growth that it will also affect your own party members. So if you have like a full frontline party composition, you either want to cast it away from where everybody's going or perhaps pick a different spell. At level 10, we get to take another favored enemy and natural explorer. Your favored enemy choice, once again, doesn't matter what you take here combat wise. And for Natural Explorer, while well, you already have poison resistance from the protection from poison spell that you should be in the habit of casting. So you might as well now grab protection from cold. You'll now have resistance to fire, poison, and cold damage basically at all times. At level 11, you get another spell and a new class action. Also, your ranger's HP should have now surpassed 100. 
For your spell choice, you can really take whatever you want here. Daylight is good to have on at least one of your party members. Lightning Arrow can also be a powerful spell, and it's not a bad idea to at least have the ability to cast a ranged magical offensive spell with your ranger, but nothing here really is core to this build. The class actions that you gain at level 11 as a hunter ranger are Volley and Whirlwind Attack. Not going to be using the AoE Volley ranged attack all that much with our low dexterity, but Whirlwind Attack can be great. This is a melee AoE attack where your ranger does a spin, striking at all enemies that are within the Whirlwind's radius. Whirlwind Attack can be used twice as it qualifies for extra attack. And don't forget, after you're done Whirlwinding, you'll still have your bonus offhand attack to strike at a single opponent. With Hunter's Mark active, two AoE swings, getting Colossus Slayer to proc, and an offhand attack, this can be great damage. And finally, we have made it to max level 12. Easy and simple choice here if you've been dual wielding up to this point is to take the ability score improvement and boost your strength up to 20, giving you a plus five modifier. You can't go wrong with this, and there's really no other feats that offer more of a power increase than this. If you're using two-handed weapons, you may already have a 20 in strength, and therefore you could boost your constitution from 16 to 18, which is never a bad thing. Or if you did take the Great Weapon Master feat before this, now's the time that you want to boost your strength to 20 as well. And that'll be it for this build guide video. Many more to come, including some multi-classing builds, and I'll catch you all on the next one.